Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Toy Guys Talking, and very happy to be chatting once again with Mark Weber, not Weber. Weber. Right. How you doing, Mark? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. So, just before I hit record, I was telling you I've got certain trigger words. Don't use them with me. Trigger is one of them. Okay. The word trigger triggers me. Fair enough. It's <laughs> easy to remember. We're from the same era, so they're probably the same words that trigger you, but influencer <laughs> is another one. Yep. Brand. Oh. Which I, I, I know it's not a trigger for you because you worked on a brand. Yeah. So you're fine with the word brand. But uh, for people who don't know, uh, and I had a blast chatting with you on What's On Joe Mind uh, with uh, Mike, the guy who's driving the value of all the beachheads worldwide up. That's it. Other than that, he's a fantastic guy. But uh, learned on that one, awkwardly learned <laughs> that you used to work for Hasbro. And you had a hand in, uh, in that amazing RC they did a few years ago. So uh, I, I just wanted to find out more about what it was like to work for uh, the Hasenfeld brothers. Yeah, well, I mean, I had, uh, you know, the toy career actually started with McFarland Toys out in Arizona. So I did a good decade there after a couple of years in sports radio. And then uh, you know, I was always a diehard G.I. Joe fan. And I wasn't really looking. Um, we were happy in Arizona. That's where my wife's family was. And I was happy at McFarland Toys. Todd's a great guy uh, and a fun place to work. But a buddy of mine who was actually ex McFarlane. Has anyone, um, sorry to cut in, but has anyone ever called him McFarlane? Uh, I don't think so. But we started, so, the best nickname was his dad is kind of a gypsy. And I mean that in the best term of the word, right? He would drive to all of our shows from Calgary. So this is Todd's dad, mid 70s, uh, Bob. And he's literally the best person I've ever met in my life. Like, I want to be Bob when I grow up. He is uh, like 80% teddy bear and 20% hard ass. I'm surprised and Todd never made a figure of Bob. Mc... Bob I mean, he's so unassuming, like no big deal. Uh, but he still plays hockey at near 80. Wow. Like he's just the best guy ever. I was and asking so... if anyone had ever called him McFarlane because guilty. I've, oh, I've called it McFarlane Toys. And ever since I started doing the channel, trying to be a good boy and learn the proper pronunciation of Nika, Nika, whatever. You know, uh, I used to right. call Bob Budiansky, Bud Budiansky uh, forever. Um, so I've learned it's McFarlane, but still every once in a it's while. It's definitely Mc, McFarlane. Yeah. And uh, we, we dubbed his dad the Todd father. Because to that, that just made sense, right? And we love Bob. So yeah. But I, anyway, uh, a decade at McFarlane Toys and then a buddy of mine who had uh, gotten out of the toy business, but a good buddy saw there was an opening at Hasbro on G.I. Joe. Hmm. So he just sent me the link with the, what the year title was that? of the email. This was 2000, late 2011. Okay, so which line would that have been that they were working on? I mean, I think they were just gearing up for movie one, right? Where's Back then. So, yeah. uh, so I, of course, threw my hat in the ring and did a stealth interview tied into a Disneyland vacation that was in and out same day. And they got back to me and said, uh, we love you. We think you do great on Joe, but we have a more critical opening on Transformers that they need to fill right away. Oh, and it's one level up. Just so like the old days where they used to cross pollinate G.I. Joe and Transformers. And I think both brands benefited from that. So yeah, I'm glad to hear they're I still doing so. it. And it's, it's a big thing at Hasbro that they promote a lot of horizontal movement. Mm -hmm. So they like their brand managers. Uh, to move around a lot. Ah, I, I, I as long that. as you don't say, maybe it's not the word brand. Maybe it's the combination of the words grow and brand. <laughs> that <laughs> triggers me. We're talking about the brand. <laughs> grow right? the brand. Uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, it was, you know, for me, uh, I think I think most Joe, most people who love Joe best probably love Transformers second. Yeah. And I think that I think that flip is often common, too, because they ran yeah. back to back. Yeah. television wise so they were uh they were so intertwined i mean it was um it was x-men and avengers you know yeah. it was they went together like peanut butter and ladies <laughs> just like that <laughs> so, so they, uh, i gotta they watch that ricky bobby movie again so i could pick up a few more that's the only one i ever remember uh, cal naughton jr's horrible they go together like and they had a, they rattle off a bunch of horrible you know what things go together like but that's the only one i can remember <laughs> I was just uh, just brushing up on Step Brothers today, actually. And I was <laughs> oh no! The the PowerPoint for Prestige Worldwide. So I was I'm 
I'm I'm half aligned with you right now. Just one movie up. Awesome. Uh, so anyway, that was uh, they offered me the Transformers gig. So before you know it, would have been February 2012. I'm out at Hasbro on Transformers as they are. It was after Dark of the Moon. So, so I was arriving as they were really going to ramp up the generation segment, which I got to play a hand in. And they were just getting the inkling of the, the early writing for Age of Extinction at that point. And did you ever go to the headquarters there, the legendary headquarters? And was it Pawtucket? Yeah, that's where I worked. Hmm. So I was in Pawtucket, Hallowed, you know, every day. Hallowed it, Halls, right? I mean, it really is. And there's... Uh, like it's it's a little bit scary because it's an old old brick building and they keep what they keep on site is all in the basement they call it the dungeon and so if you need an old sample of something they have like paper records sometimes of what might be down there and you have to wear a mask even you know in 2012 uh because the radon down in the basement was pretty high oh, so wow. people didn't go down there or hang out there very often and it was all chicken wire coops and stuff but old old stuff and you know i wish it was what everybody hopes it is that it was all pristine and vintage and anything you wanted but it had been down there so long that bump I, up I, and a lot of stuff that said it was there wasn't there and it was always a bit of a of a slightly depressing treasure trove i just but, have this uh well, anyway I have this feeling that the reason it was irradiated it was because of all of the um, the neon '90s Joes down there was just finally right. like <laughs> that could have been it. Or the chemical dip Zartans down there just cooking for a couple decades. Eco warriors, <laughs> <laughs> thousands of unsold equal. I'm like a kid in a candy store today. Um, you know, this is awesome to be able to talk to not just a, a person who worked there, but a fan who work there. Yeah. I mean, you didn't just come in and you went to school for this stuff and, you know, you, you learn the books on how to do the job. Um, you know, we've, uh, myself and so many of my friends have been talking for years about, they need to put someone who cares and loves this stuff, is passionate about it and doesn't, doesn't just get the name of it, but gets the spirit of it. So one of the things I want to talk to you before yeah. we go more into what you did for Hasbro was, uh, toys, like what toys did you grow up on and what were your favorites? I, I mean, I was uh, my first Joe ever was, is the black sheep, really, of the GI Joe family. It's Super Joe. You oh know, that no! Little, yeah, <laughs> I love little, Super Joe, but oh well, no! I think I think he's cool, but the fact that you know most the big Joe argument, well, now it's six inch mixed in, was always, are you a twelve inch Joe guy or a three and three quarter guy? And it totally omits Super Joe, like he never existed. Because nobody, you know, that eight inch scale is just odd. There's never been, you know, a long running hit at that sort of intermediate scale. And the fact that he inherited 12 inch vehicles that he could barely see over the steering wheel of. And, but that was my first show. I remember that big orange combining C tank, whatever thing. And a lot of fans won't even know what that is. They'll go, what are you talking about? There's the 12 inch Joe's there's the three and three core. What is the super Joe? And I didn't have the official eight inch Joe's, but, um, I grew up, uh, playing with like, they were in the, what's equivalent to a dollar store these days, you know, bargain heralds used to have knockoff, uh, you know, Mego size, basically they were Johnny something. I forget what they were called. But uh, military dudes, like Navy, Army, Jungle, uh, all that stuff. So that was fantastic, especially for a little kid, because the 12-inch can be a little overwhelming for a little kid. There's right. a lot going on there. But the uh, the Super Joe scale, you know, you still got the clothes, but it's uh, it's not too complicated. The guns aren't too complicated and super durable, too. Yeah, I dug him. And a couple of years ago at, uh, at Joe Con, Brian Savage was going around and handing out a shirt to everybody on his staff and, and selected people. And it had the Super Joe logo on the front and he handed me one. And I'm like, that's awesome. Cause it, you know, he didn't know it, but it brings me full circle to the first Joe under the Christmas tree for me was Super Joe. So I, I had a few of that line and then I was, and so that was an kid. official release. The eight inch Joe's were official release. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was what they did after Adventure Team kind of lost its steam. Yeah. And uh, because the petroleum prices went so high in the 70s with the gas ratcheting. They reduced them. 
Yeah, because they were using so I mean, it is plastic based, which is all plastic is all petroleum based. So yeah. they wanted to put Joe out, but it was getting too expensive at 12 inches. And so they decided they would roll the dice on an eight inch line that did OK. I think it lasted two or three years and then kind of without any entertainment behind it, it yeah. just kind of faded away. And then that was the dark period before the, the operation blast off and and the 82 Joes. So. I was a, a Star Wars kid. I was born in 73. So I was, you know, into Star Wars like every other kid my age. But when Joe arrived in 82 and Stalker was my first one off the pegs, the and it's funny because now I'm a guy who rages against articulation a little bit because uh, I think he can go too far. Yeah. Uh, but man, with the, the posable legs that would go, you know, you could do the split, you bend at the knee bend at the elbow it was just it was so much better mm -hmm. than star wars that pretty much i still liked star wars but as a toy collector i was done i was so into joe and i still think you know you can't i don't think i'll ever replicate it for me and even for kids today the idea that you would find the first joe on the pegs just knowing that it was february march and that new one will be here sometime. So you had eight or nine failed trips down the toy aisle before the win. Yeah. And then you, whoever it was, didn't matter who it was, you grabbed the first one and flipped it over to look at the mini explosion cross cells on the back and see what else is coming this year. And then to an even greater extent, kind of the first vehicle where you would, didn't matter what the vehicle was, just get it and get that catalog and pull it open. Yeah. And and immediately you're looking at it and you're gauging what's likely uh you know what in within whatever your family's price ranges are. It's all Which about one, what's the birthday present? What's my Christmas ask? And is there anything I just never will get yeah which is your aircraft carrier the basically. thrill of the hunt was so important. I'm really enjoying the thrill of the hunt this year because um, I was like anybody else. I mean, when the conventions happened, the toy fairs, San Diego Comic Con, sure, I, I got nothing going on that day, and I'd love to know what's going on. Hop on all the news sites and see all the pictures. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I'm killing the thrill of my hunt by doing all that stuff. Same with, uh, I right. learned this a few years ago, watching trailers over and over again. I, I started to learn that going, hey, I'm killing my interest for this movie. So this year, not really watching any of the uh, the online conventions and not knowing anything that's coming out. And I'm seeing stuff on pegs I didn't know was coming out. And I'm absolutely loving it. And Luana just brought me a fresh baked chocolate chip cookie. Speaking of the thrill of the hunt. Um, I think you should get in on that. <laughs> it's nice to not have to hunt uh, uh, some things. But uh, when you were uh, talking about the articulation of the of the G.I. Joe, and I will take a bite out of this. Yeah, <laughs> when you give, me, start, give me a question. When you start you rolling. Mean... But uh, I can think, you know, the old expression, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I think uh, that uh, that rule, uh, there are two exceptions to that rule. Two times they fixed something that wasn't broke and they made it better. The uh, G.I. Joe arm, swivel arm. Yep. Hey, it wasn't broke, but man, that's so much better. And then in 85, when they added the ball joint neck yeah. to be able to look up and down, it's like, once again, you didn't need to change it, but wow, that's so much better. Well, and that's a bit I get into a little bit now because I'm the guy who rages against the brutal chest cut on the six oh. inch figures. Yeah. Because unless you're a knight or a cyborg or a female, there's nowhere to hide that cut. Mm -hmm. And and I just don't think it, it offers superior. I think the the posing and the articulation bump you get is not that much better than a waist swivel. I've so, no, I've noticed that on the classified. Have you seen the the classified Joes yet? Yeah, I've got. I, I think I have. I either have all of them or they're coming. So they're ama I think they're amazing design. Great. I mean, I've I've handled uh, Marvel Legends. I've handled the Star Wars Black series and went. Okay, th this is impressive. This is really impressive. And I just figured Snake Eyes, all the other Joes, it's just going to be the same thing, right? Different sculpt. Yeah. Same. They're a bit different. And, yeah, a little bit. And to me, it feels like they're a bit better. You know, this well, is, it, I like it. It even goes back to the to the 25th anniversary Joes, where they changed the articulation to give them a torso swivel and take away the hip. And, 
And almost immediately, they started adding secondary straps and jackets and vests mm -hmm. that half covered up and made almost unusable this cut that they're sacrificing the figure aesthetic for. So some guys got away with it better than others. But then there are some guys like Flash or Tripwire who, who wear a giant catcher's chest protector. Yeah. And they would just gut it in the middle and go, yeah, whatever. Like a bazooka. Is there a worse figure? He's got a big 14 on his chest, yeah. and you're going to cut it and then offset it anytime you pose him. I just, it it makes me sad as a Big Joe fan that as the champions of articulation, back to the 12-inch Joe, and then the three-and-three-quarter Joe, which had already kicked Star Wars' ass in articulation, and one year into it, they said, you know what, we can make it better. It's not good enough for them to just. That's called make. dancing in the end zone. Right? <laughs> That's spike in the football. <laughs> but, but for now, for them to just mimic what's out there mm -hmm. at the six inch scale and go, we'll just put Joe on that frustrates me. And, and to give a nod to McFarlane, they have a, uh, a Fortnite figure called Red Strike, yep. where the torso, there's actually a spine on the inside, and the low, at least the lower torso is soft ABS. So he's wearing like a jacket, but it's soft, it's flexible. So you get that torso articulation without having to put a slice right through the middle of the torso. And that's the kind of stuff that Todd's somewhat known for and that Hasbro used to be known for. And I just, it frustrates me to no end that they decided that this is just good enough because that's never been in Joe's DNA. Mm -hmm. And um, and I know the I know the guy who designs uh, the classified figures. Lenny is a wonderful designer and a great artist. And we've never actually had it out, but I'm sure he's aware of my position on on that spot. And I just think it's they there has to be a way to do it better. And if the soft ABS isn't it, then somebody else there or somewhere else should figure this out. And it's also got to be frustrating for Lenny, who designs this stuff and says, you know, please do it justice. And then um, you don't know what's going to happen in the factory. You don't oh, know sure. how, how certain parts are going to um, work together. And there's some snake eyes that are fantastic. And then there are some who just can't stand upright. You know, there's just that, that ab crunch unless yeah. you put some crazy glue, which is an easy fix, right? But I get it. People buying a, a figure for quite a few bucks. I mean, it's, it's a lot more than a, a Joe was back in the day, you know, two or $3. Yeah. You, you don't want to have to fix a brand new expensive high end collectors and uh, figure it to make it how it should have been out of the factory. Yeah. You shouldn't have to customize a figure to make him stand up. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's, that's part of, I think the contract between company and, and consumer is that it should do the basic things. Like, I mean, I know most toys have the, some poses require hand support thing, mm -hmm. but that shouldn't be for standing up straight, right? Like yeah. that should be for ninja kicks and, yeah. and stuff. But So Stalker was one of your first Joes. Who are some of your other favorite early Real American Hero characters? I I, I don't remember if, if Snake Eyes was an option for me because I, I find it hard to believe I would have passed up on him. Uh, but Stalker, if you look at, at the original Joes, they're, they are very similar. They reuse a lot of the same stuff. But Stalker really stood out, right? With camo. all the camo, the yeah. beret, and I never so I was... for years I never understood why did he only come with one weapon. I looked at um, Scarlet and I went, "Okay, I get it. She's, she's got a lot of original tooling, so that's why they gave her one crossbow." But the crossbow is awesome, even if it's one weapon. I mean, it's a very intricate, delicate looking thing. Stalker for years I just didn't get it. I'm like, "What? One measly machine gun?" And then I realized. Oh, the camo must have been such a, we take it for granted today. Everything is camo, but right. back in that, like back then, that must have been a colossal pain to do those yeah, individual sure. camo spots. Well, and, and I'm I, have you heard the story of how snake eyes came to be? Oh, well, yeah, he was, yeah. Okay. Well, that go they, ahead. Uh, share well, with they, me. they just kept stripping paint ops off the figures. So his original bit was that he was going to look more like the other Joes yeah. and, and at least have some, have some paint ops. And they went, they kept going back. And then this would happen all the time where they'd go, I like it, but you got to lose five paint ops, bring it, bring the cost down a penny. Okay, fine. 
And they got cut so much that when they finally went back in, they said, if they tell us to cut any more, we're done. We'll tell them, absolutely not. Can't lose any more deco. And that's the kind of thing you say before a meeting with right. senior management. And then when they say, it's great, five more paint ops and you're golden. And they said, you know what? No more. Because there was a lot riding on the relaunch of G.I. Joe, right? If it failed, you may not have ever heard of it again, or it would have been 10 more years, right? Yeah. And so they said, you know what? We'll just sacrifice one guy. One guy gets no paint. Yeah. And then that'll be the ops that we save. And so they, they took it off Snake Eyes, and they said, you know what? Sorry for you, Commando, but we are going to sacrifice you and make you so boring, but you will be the sacrificial lamb that lets everybody else stay cool enough to keep the brand alive for year two. And did and they then, did they create the chase figure by doing that in a sense, like by making because I'm thinking the attorney and minis, which uh, I just went through the chase figure they made is just a repaint of the He-Man. He's a clear green He-Man. They call him Slime Pit He-Man. And the other chase figure is a repaint of something else. And I'm wondering, like, isn't that kind of where the the birth of the chase figure came from where the chase figure isn't like original tooling, lots of weapons, you know, it's not Tundra stalker. It's yeah. uh, it's the leftovers and uh, Hey, you know, wh why don't we make this thing that looks like it's less than and make him, you know, more than. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, most people equate the term chase or, you know, variant or, or whatever with a lower print run. Yep. And that certainly wasn't the case for Snake Eyes. He was as heavy as anybody else. And then when they got to run more, once it was a runaway, they printed a lot more Snake Eyes. So the the guy I heard that wasn't selling with the other guys was Short Fuse because oh, really? the weapon is a little bit weird. Yeah, the more. Or compared to, you know, for your average oh, fan. And I loved it. He was one of my first Joes. I loved the mortar with the big stand on it. Just like. I remember asking my brother, how does it work? What is it, a bazooka? And he's like, no, you uh, you take a shell and you drop it, and you, but you have to be fast or you'll blow right. your hand off. And I'm like, well, this guy sounds amazing. This is easy, <laughs> right? Right. This. <laughs> like... Right. And the, and the way they wrote about him, how he was brilliant and how he could triangulate azimuths and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, the angles and, and stuff. Worms, basically. The game worms. Right. <laughs> yeah, and they, and they made him... I mean, they never really got into it much other than the comic. But he was... He had a... They called him short views because he had temper. Yeah. Right? I loved that. That was part of the reason I fell in love. These guys have personality. They come from places. And their names and they have even. Background. And their names come from their personalities. It wasn't just uh, the name came from what they did. You know, like the so, sometimes it did. Flash, you know, totally yeah. has to do with his weapon, his specialty. But then sometimes you'd think they'd be able to easily find a code name for the mortar specialist. Bombs away or whatever. But no, he's got a short temper. That doesn't really have anything to do with a mortar. Um, you know, same with uh, Stalker. Snake Eyes totally is a, a more personality trait than a, you know, commando sneaking type of... Which, you know, before we move on, I wanted to ask you, how'd you get the code name Honcho? I, it was... Uh, Mike made it up out of nowhere. Yeah. And it was when I would visit uh, What's on Joe Mind. And, and because Hasbro is very tight with what their employees are allowed to do on uh, on social media... I didn't really have much of a presence online and I was, I was a guy who read a lot, but didn't post much as a fan. So my, most people had no idea who I was. Uh, and then once I was out of Hasbro, uh, I was, you know, welcome to do whatever, you know, whatever I wanted. And I, and I knew Mike and Joe from the shows. So I was a regular fill in when they would have the regular, one of their regular hosts out. And he would always butcher my old title of what I was at Hasbro, or he would say the guy who was in charge of GI Joe. And that was never true. Never <laughs> true. It was when I worked on Joe, it was always Daryl DePriest who was the senior vice president. And I was the manager of global brand development. So now it was a small team, a team of two basically. Yeah. So, you know, I had a lot of pull on a very small Island, but I was, I was never the chief. You never were Duke. In charge, you so, were Duke. Yeah. You weren't hey, the no. colonel or the general, but you were, you know, you're the boss. <laughs> I was, I was fine with where I was. I was master you know, sergeant. It's, it's a pretty good role to have. There's nothing wrong with that, man. Yeah. And if, if you'd have told, you know, eight year old me 
that that would be my job at least for a little while. Like I, I never would have believed it. So and in a lot of cases, I, I think the master sergeant has more respect from the troops than the general. Well, or, yeah, or the colonel. Cool. Yeah, I'm I'm getting stuff done. <laughs> so no, no offense, to, no offense to Daryl. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he kept saying, you know, the guy who ran GI Joe or the 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 honcho in charge of GI Joe, and I would correct <laughs> okay. him every time. And finally, because out of respect for Daryl, right, I didn't want to misrepresent, you know, what I did on the brand or what position I held. And so finally, he just started calling me former Honcho uh -huh. of the G.I. Joe brand. And I'm like, you know what? Cool. I'll take it. That's a great code name. A, a Joe should have had that code name, a, a top brass Joe. Yeah, you would. And, and that would be the kind of guy. It would be a Duke Flint type, right? Like a yeah. leader, a leader, but in the field, not a maybe a, that pencil maybe. push. Maybe if Flint Dilly had turned the job down, they would have been like, well, screw Flint. We'll call this guy Warren Officer Honcho instead. <laughs> I, I, I would have bought that figure, right? Yeah. But there were there were very few I didn't buy. So I guess that's a, a low bar. Um, 25th anniversary. What did you think of those when they came out? I, I mean, I was just happy to see. I was always a fan of anything, Joe, even when I didn't like it specifically. Sigma so, 6. <laughs> well, that was it. When Sigma 6 came out, I said cool but i don't i don't need those not for I'm me good. i'm good with what i have what i think they don't get enough credit for for sigma 6 it's the best packaging ever mm. with the top the top and the bottom of the pack make uh, an ammo pack or an ammo crate and they had a blinking red light on the packaging mm -hmm. you walk by it in the aisle and it's saying take a look take a look take a look take a look like they must have sunk like a quarter of the cost with the big hard plastic shell case like a quarter of that figure's cost had to be in the packaging so, so come a long way since no paint applications on snake eyes right <laughs> right and yeah. but the one the one thing so I, I didn't wish it poorly i said i hope sigma six is such a big hit that i get my three and three quarter guys back yeah and and the thing i'll never understand is when they actually went to a separate scale on sigma six yeah, the tiny and they ones. went and they went to two and a half inches like you're gonna green light a second scale and not do what Joe has been for twenty years. Yeah. I I'll never understand that. So yeah. anyway, I like I rooted for Sigma Six. I was happy to see three and three quarter come back. I didn't like the chest cut from jump. Um and I knew it would be a problem because they were rebuilding uh a parts library. Excuse me, a part. So I knew this is what it was gonna be for a long, long time. Yeah, because they would never go back on and abandon all that tooling that they'd already put together. So, but I was I was thrilled to see it. Uh, and when you look back at as a guy, when I worked on Joe, we had very few items a year. We were doing Toys R Us exclusives and event exclusives, basically. And you look back at some of those early years when they had like eleven comic book packs. Mm -hmm. Like, I was getting like four items a year for Joe. Yeah. And I would look back at this embarrassment of support and go, God, I wish I'd had those groceries to cook with. Yeah. But anyway. It, you mentioned earlier, like, if there's a misstep, if you don't do it right, because of how much was riding in 1982 on the line, that you might never see it again, or more realistically, because it seems like the brand, you know, the brand was successful enough that it would it would receive another life, but it would take another 10 or 15 years and I think Sigma Six costs the brand dearly. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, I have had the same uh, opinion as you. It was fine, but I just look at it. It's like when I look at Classified and I go, it's fine, but there's a swimming pool of potential. And you've just taken a glass and yeah. gone like that and gone, hey, you know, this is a great glass of lemonade. <laughs> but, but if you had done the classics... If you had started with the classics and every once in a while, basically doing exactly what the anniversary line was, doing the classics, and then you throw in a Resolute figure or two. Right. And then you throw in another, you know, uh, the ninjas that had never been made, unfinished business figures, as I call them. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, the 25th anniversary line was a hit. It it, mm -hmm. it didn't just poof, vanish. It It went on a long, long, long time. And kind of got renamed and repackaged, mm -hmm. but it kept going and going and going until the 50th anniversary, which was, you know, the ultimate version of those modern figures. And, and now the retro figures, 
you gotta love this you know retro figures have you gotten the new retro figure have you seen right. the retro figures mark and i just go yeah i saw them what is it a decade ago right they're right here them. yeah i have them actually yeah. these are retro figures it's not yeah. it's not new <laughs> it's yeah. the same thing well and I, I thought they didn't do themselves any favor by not addressing that at uh new york at their toy fair presentation right it's con yeah and there was already news out there, you know, and people already knew, had confirmed through Walmart listings that a retro line was coming. So they already knew it. And, you know, either either they knew it would be poorly received and didn't want to overshadow, you know, put a dark cloud over the classified uh, unveiling, or they didn't know it wouldn't be received that well. Mm -hmm. So, but either way, even I was always, always with all my brands. Uh, there I go again. Anything <laughs> no, I, I think I've, uh, I've realized that brand is fine. Brand growth yeah, <laughs> is what <right>? triggers. <laughs> but any, anytime we do something. I'm, uh, like I just got to say, I'm very grateful that we didn't start off by you saying, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to collaborate and grow our brands. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's the one that got me. Here's my pet peeve. And it's a very Hasbro thing because I never heard it before. And I've rarely heard it since when someone is going to tell you they're not going to do what you're proposing. They would say, you know what? I don't disagree. Oh. And then they would tell you why they're disagreeing. And <laughs> people heard it so much that they adopted it. Right. And I don't disagree. Like, whew. Like it's, if there's a more double negative sentence, it's very that's very shifty. It's yeah. uh, kind of in the same vein as uh, no offense, but <laughs> yeah, right. Like, you know that but the but is coming, but the retro line. Like I I don't know if they knew it was going to be poorly received and then decided not to talk about it because they were unveiling classified, yeah. or if they didn't know the brand turned over uh, like the week before. Toy Fair, uh, it moved back. It was being done out in Burbank, and it got shifted back to Pawtucket. And Ben Montano took over the brand, who runs Transformers, and is a guy I worked with, a great guy, a real talent there. But he had he said it in his panel. I've been on the brand three days, so I'm not sure you know what he inherited and what he had time to to fix. But Waiting that long to unveil the retro line that was not going to be markedly different from figures most collectors already have. Yeah. That was prob probably not helpful. Just don't use the word retro. I think yeah. that's what the problem was. It, the, the retro Star Wars figures are retro. They're reissues. The retro Ghostbuster, uh, retro this, retro. There are the He Man retro figures by Super 7 look. They're new, but they look same articulation, basically yeah. construction other than the legs. Don't call it a retro Joe, and then it's a modern Joe. It's modern. Right. It's not retro. I mean, it sort of looks like a a, a retro Joe, but you know, these are these are some of the things that I don't think it's it's being too picky and too nitpicky. It's almost, I don't know, maybe this sounds silly, but it's almost like releasing those retro figures and saying reissue. This isn't a reissue of anything. Well, yeah, it is. It's Roadblock, right? Yeah, a reissue would be the O ring. Don't yeah. call it a reissue, obviously, right? That's obvious. Don't call it a retro. I thought that would have been obvious too. Well, and I think, and you know, it's, it's always tied to item count at Hasbro, and Joe is a brand that always seems to get squeezed. Uh, but it doesn't take much to make it awesome. The Hiss Tank, no, you can't have too many Hiss Tanks. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the five best vehicles, probably the best Cobra vehicle, not too expensive. If a figure right now is 13 bucks. And you can get a Hiss tank and a driver for 25 The value is incredible. Yeah. And the driver is new enough and so much better than the previous one yeah. that it's an absolute home run. I think the and, box is worth that, the price alone. Right. It's it's fantastic. And so, but again, it's not the, the cost or the tooling so much because a lot of it is, is reused parts with some newness. Uh, it's that it counts as an item. Like if I change Scarlet's eye color on a figure, it's now a new item. The rest of it can be same packaging, same figure, same accessories, same barcode. And if I have a designer maker, green eyed, not blue, that counts as a brand new figure. The same as if I tooled her new head to toe. Hmm. And so 
you gotta you gotta accept a certain amount of reuse because the reu the purely reused figures don't count against that item count that's so precious. When you were there, was there ever any talk about O ring reissues? Not while I was on Joe. Um, and I was on from 14 to 17. So, and I called it, you know, when I was there, I called it low tide because I firmly believed we would bring it back. And you don't want to use terms like hiatus or ramping down or a coma. Si <laughs> siesta. Yeah. You don't want to use any of those. Um, but we were really just barely afloat with Joe because it was Toys R Us only. And I think before I had gotten there, they had moved to vehicle packs that were gigantic, like a medium vehicle with a big vehicle for 70 bucks. Yeah, those were and amazing. They were cool, and, and they were what Toys R Us requested because they wanted a bigger, a bigger dollar spend if somebody was going to get into the vehicles. But in the end, I think it was counterproductive for the line and for them because hardly anybody bought multiples. Yeah, that's true. But if I gave you the option to buy three vamps and five hiss tanks, you might. You might buy two rattlers if you could for sixty-five dollars. But that gigantic box, the storage is hard for the adult collector because you know a lot of us don't open our stuff like we used to, and it's a you know it's just a bigger dent in the wallet. And so mm -hmm. I think that was a mistake on Toys R Us's part. And in the end, they they said the sales weren't enough to justify these gigantic price points, and that that's pretty much what killed vehicles for Joe. And Joe is has always been as much a vehicle line as a figure line. So once the vehicles were gone altogether, it it kind of spelled the uh, the upcoming doom for Joe. And then and the other bit was GI Joe three. When I joined the brand in fall of 2014, was supposed to come out spring 2016, right? Four and a half years ago, and it just got bumped over and over and over and over again, and with no entertainment behind it and no movie on the horizon. That's sort of what led Joe, you know, to the coma, and also, unfortunately, led me to the door I at think. Hasbro. Oh. What are uh, but let's talk about happier times. Sure. <laughs> you you got led the door uh, shown the door because of RC, right? I was talking on the What's on Joe Mind podcast. I said, and I didn't realize you had actually contributed to that. And I said, well, whoever worked on that one, that was so fantastic. They probably got rewarded by you know, there's the door. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, the releases that you contributed to and and what your contributions were to them. I mean, I was on uh, Transformers first, and it was right when they were hyping the fall of Cybertron game from High Moon Studios, which is, I think, just a phenomenal game with good storytelling and, you know, the Dinobots in it. And toy-wise, it led to the expansion of the Generations line, which had just been deluxe figures before. And it led to the first Voyager scale, the Grimlocks and... And, and the like. And then they also had uh, the, the smaller ones, you know, the 799 guys, uh, 999 eventually. And then also led to Metroplex, right? The first Titan. The Thrilling which, 30. Yep. Oh, and the Thrilling 30. That was, they were already working on Metroplex when I got put, I don't want to say in charge, but when I was moved to Generations as the marketing guy. And uh, immediately we were working on the next year's stuff because the stuff that came out like Grimlock came out while I was on the brand, but I had no hand in it. That All the work on that was done well before I joined the brand. Whenever, so, I, whenever I hear uh, Metroplex uh, brought up the Thrilling 30 Titan Metroplex, um, the first thing I always think of is like, well, <laughs> whose idea was it to have a giant that couldn't stand up right? <laughs> right? Uh, well... I could I could name the designer, but I I, I probably should. But uh, doesn't didn't the Takara version stand just fine? It was the North American release that had the loose hinges. Yeah, I th I think so. It seems to be the, the case with a couple of the Titans. And sometimes Takara's stuff comes out a little later. Yeah. So they actually get to guinea pig the American release a little bit. And I mean, we've never made a toy that big, not since the original Fort Max. Mm -hmm. So. 
it was, you know, I think they, you know, they always test it, but you can only test it so long. Yeah. And some of of the the tipping metroplexes are simply supporting that weight over time. Right. And it, and it's really hard to get a gauge on that ahead of time. How is this going to age? You're a wrestling fan, right? Absolutely. Um. So Lanny Poffo, you know the legend of Lanny Poffo. In uh, I don't. Is there a specific story? I'll I'll move on here. It just has something to do with being able to bend over and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a party trick. <laughs> but I, I won't go into that. Seems to me that's what he did in most of his WWE matches. <laughs> well, it, it seems like maybe that was the intent with Metroplex as well. But, right. But uh, what, what are some of the Joe's things? Uh, Joe uh, things that you worked on while you were on brand. Well, the uh, the Joe stuff uh, came after Transformers, and the Transformers was uh, Thrilling Thirty and Combiner Wars were my two big things. Very proud of Combiner Wars. It's the biggest. Uh, it's the the dollar figure on my resume. And what it's, kind of stuff did you uh, actually contribute? Like you were in the marketing department, right? Yeah, uh, but we frequently were coming up with the actual concept for it. Oh, cool. And so we actually it came about in a meeting with IDW talking about you know where are you guys going with the toy that That's you so want awesome. incorporated into the comic. It's like the so, old days with Marvel having direct input into the Joe and yeah. Transformers line too. Yeah, and it was it was a little. I think back then it was more. You know, Larry got a list. Here are the vehicles. Put them in the comic. Yeah. <laughs> and this was a little more collaborative. And, and I loved working with John Barber and the IDW guys. And that was when uh, when the uh, the Lost Light comic was running, which is my favorite Transformers comic ever that James Roberts wrote. And so uh, they took what we things we wanted to do and they incorporated them. And one of the first things I got to say was, well, let's kill Bumblebee. And they're like, are you kidding me? But this was right after Dark of the Moon came out. Did when you they released did, like five different Bumblebee toys? Did you clear this with Dan Gilvezin? <laughs> well, no, but uh, <laughs> I probably should have. But the, the idea was there's so much of him in every branch of the brand yeah. that the generations fans, the guys who've been here forever, they don't want another Bumblebee. It doesn't yeah. matter how good it is. So we did. I mean, he came back as a ghost pretty quick. But we, I said, let's kill Bumblebee. And the IDW guys were like, can we do that? And I'm like, yeah, it, totally we can. So out of that one meeting, we got writing Bumblebee out, Megatron the Autobot, which was my pitch, which I'm proud actually happened. Wow. And then I, uh, it's Phil Jimenez, who drew Wonder Woman for a long time. Yeah. He was doing some package art for us. And he said, there's nothing better than the combiners. Why don't you put all the combiners together? And I'm like, it kind of a combiner war, right? And he's like, yeah, it'd be awesome. And so he never gets any credit for it, but he was the one who brought it up. And the idea was if we build a modular system where any guy can be an arm, any guy can, any of the limbs can exchange for each other, then the reuse is tremendous for these molds. And, you know, a lot of it you plan around reuses. So, we did that originally, and it was also on the heels of the uh, the Bruticus we made. That was before, right when I got there, it was coming out, and it was six deluxe figures making the big Bruticus. And it flew in the face of everything we knew about combiners. You needed a big guy to be the torso yeah. to anchor the limbs. And instead, they went with six little guys, and Bruticus fell apart left and right because he had no core. Sort so of like Devastator. Like the original Devastator, right? Cool yeah. looking. You couldn't really play with them. Not yeah. as Devastator. So, and 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 you saw how they learned from that back in the day. Well, we we repeated that error, and then repeated the learning, and so we got to do the uh, the Combiner Wars, which was such a hit that it was the first time and the only time I remember that the retailers said when we said our you know this year is Thrilling Thirty, but next year is Combiner Wars. Three months into Combiner Wars, they said, you can't kill it at the end of the year. It's too hot. We want you to stretch it through June of the next year. So it actually ran for a year and a half. And so I was on the brand and then offered the chance to move to Joe. So I left the brand before Combiner Wars actually at retail. But because your work takes so long to come out, yeah. they, that, they were all mine, all mine. And I was so pleased to see them sell so well 
and be received so fondly by the fan base. And then you moved over to Joe, and what are some of the uh, releases that you worked on there? The the Joe stuff that I worked on was was some of the 50th anniversary stuff and the the San Diego Comic Con stuff, and I worked uh, in partnership with the Collectors Club. Did you have so, something to do with the Sarge Collectors uh, San Diego Comic Con uh, the, exclusive? The Creo set, the little one, or the big guy? The the well, the four inch uh, Sergeant Slaughter. That was that was the year before. Before okay. The year before I just, so I I did the we were always doing Transformer crossover sets. So I did the Rattler as Power Glide oh, cool. and Soundwave Hiss Tank and uh but some of the ones that actually the the first one that I got done because the line was almost finished for Comic Con was uh the Sightline figure, which is a big deal in the Joe community and it was, you know, based on uh, his full name was Gary Head, yeah. but he went by Gary Goggles. Gary Goggles. And he was an icon in the community in, in the very best sense of the word, a wonderful guy who encouraged, he wasn't an elitist kind of, I'm a big deal, like there are in every fan base. Yeah. He was a guy who wanted to encourage uh, the growth of the brand. He would give toys to kids at shows. Like, he was that kind of guy. And everything I know about him is secondhand. And I've always been very clear about that. I never met him. I never traded emails with him. Uh, I knew who he was because I was a Joe fan before I joined the brand. And he passed away that spring mm -hmm. and they were finalizing this sightline character and he wasn't named yet, but he was supposed to be the, the forward spotter basically for the airstrikes, what bomb strike is as well, basically. And Hasbro had just issued an edict that said no more designers faces on action figures, no more file cards named for friends. None of that. Because a guy who was, I think, DJ or somebody, the facial basis for a Joe in the 80s, had filed a lawsuit saying, oh, that's yeah. me, and they're making money off me. Oh, no. So they decided no more of this, which happened all the time, right? They needed yeah. a face. They grabbed Harry from sculpting, used him. Yeah. So they had just put that edict down, and I said to, to uh, Daryl, I know they just said never again, but this guy is critically important to the uh well so well respected he just passed away really young and this figure and this was the only, the main reason why it worked was covered head to toe not an inch of visible skin on this figure and, and he had big goggles yes yeah. yeah and i went we have you know if they don't let us fine but we got to try and uh daryl said i'll ask i'll ask because he was, you know, a senior, senior VP, so he was going to get a guess where I he might get a guess where I would definitely get a no. And he went up to legal. He got their approval, uh, provided the family was okay with it, and that's a big step. Yeah. And that was something I had a little bit of of uh, experience with. At McFarland Toys, we made figures for retired uh, sports athletes, current and retired. And sometimes a guy would pass away. Reggie White, I remember, passed away very suddenly. And we had never made a figure of him. He just retired in the middle of when we were and didn't, didn't have the license. So fans immediately clamored, you got to make a Reggie White figure. And it's like, you really can't knock on that door, no matter how respectfully you're going to do it, and yeah. say, we're so sorry about your husband's passing, but hey, how about an action figure? So Daryl actually knew uh, Gary a little bit, and he reached out to the, to his widow, uh, and he had two little girls, I think. And I didn't handle any of that, and Daryl should have because he knew the, the guy better than I did. And she said, sure, and to make sure it was all completely above, not above board, but, but uh, buttoned up, they actually signed a contract and paid her a little Um for the likeness, even though the likeness did not exist. Right. So, and then they gave her like 25 of these giant box sets. Yeah. So everybody in his family got one and it meant a lot to the community. And so to be able to, to get a yes, when they had just slammed the door and said, never again, yeah. uh, I thought that was really cool. It meant a lot to the community. Uh, it was good for me, not just because it was the right thing to do, 
but it showed that I was in touch with the community. I knew what was going on and what would be important and what would resonate. So uh, Sightline was the big one. I got Shooter made, the 13th Joe, who was yeah. unnamed in the, in the first or 14th Joe. Do you know what first Shooter's book. first name is? Yeah, it's... Uh, Jim. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Uh, but, but the character, when they made her yeah. for uh, for Devil's Due Comics, yeah, great was based, issue. Off, based off a real person that Larry knew, like most of the original Joes were. That was a nice and, little Easter egg that turned into a great story, actually. The the, yeah. gar, the Joe's guardian angel that we never yeah. knew they had. Love that, love that story. And I didn't, I didn't, ex, I didn't have a lot of exchanges with Larry, other than he wrote in a letters column. Uh, somebody said, "How come you draw the Joes like they looked in the '80s? Because the book is modern time." And he said, "I draw what I know, and Hasbro hasn't sent me toys in years." And like you could hear the crash tinkle of my heart when I read that. Like <laughs> if anybody's the godfather of modern GI Joe, it's Larry. And the fact that someone just at some point forgot or decided he didn't need comps anymore blew my mind. So that was a small but important part of my role on Joe was collecting the new samples when they came in and sending giant care packages to Larry to make sure he got the new stuff. Cause it still bothers me that they let that stop. So anyway, that was uh, that was Shooter. Uh, we did a new Gung Ho that was really good, but got the 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 Eagle Ball Anchor printed almost up on his neck, yeah. which was unfortunate. Well, and it's like the reverse of sagging as you age, right? He's, I guess, right? He's been doing a lot of chin-ups or something. <laughs> I can't tell you how bad it hurts when you've got something you're proud of yeah. and you get the first sample. And day one, you go, yo, tattoo's too high. And they say, too bad, they're all printed. Ugh. Like, you don't even have a chance to correct factory errors sometimes. Yeah. And that was one of them. Um, but I also did um, the Kindle World stories that were being written at the time. Oh, cool. Which was the, the fan fiction. Yeah. And that was one of my first tasks was read a bunch of it and see if it's any good. Well, and you... so I dove in, and what I found, it split in thirds, basically. There was a third that was not good at all, a third that was okay, and a third that was brilliant. And that's where we I pushed together that Create a Joe uh, poll based on Kindle World's. Did you read got, Buzz's book? I read Buzz, yeah. But the, the one I love was Bill uh, Nedro's oh, okay. books were through the roof. And he's the one that won, legitimately, won uh, and got his stiletto figure made, which was a cool-looking female mercenary figure. She was Mercer's bodyguard, which is ridiculous if you think about what a tough cat Mercer was. So that got made, and then I made a, a character called Tombstone for the Cobras, because I really felt both Joe and Transformers had lost their way a bit because they had such rich history to pull from. They stopped making new characters. Yeah. And that's what made the brands brilliant originally was look at all these new guys I'm getting this year. Mm -hmm. So getting able to make some new ones, Sightline, uh, Shooter wasn't new, but had never been made before. And, uh, and Tombstone and Stiletto was really proud of getting some newness back in the line. Like back in the day, the existing characters getting remade were once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. New Snake Eyes, and then eventually a new Stalker, and a new this, and a new that. It wasn't like 98% reused characters and and a bomb strike. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, and it, they would make, I mean, it threw me when I saw Dial Tone for the first time, right? Because I already have, I have Breaker. Breaker. Right? I don't need a new guy, but, you know, what, what, kid me doesn't know is most kids are aging out of this stuff and i love so, that joe has a nerd right dial tone is the biggest nerd joe there is you know he's right. the poster boy for nerd mistake you well, know he's the ultimate <laughs> geek nerds and, and, and grand, grand slam too his original file card is loves escapist uh fantasy science fiction and he's so. a he's a pretty tough ombre in the comic though and i was i haven't asked you yet uh, cartoon or comic or a little of both when you were growing a up? A little of both. I mean, yeah. I ate up anything, Joe. But but the comic, I loved the comic because it didn't pander to me because I was a kid, mm -hmm. right? There yeah. was loss and betrayal and, and devastation and murder. And, it was it was PG and sometimes rated R. Yeah. 
It was yeah. kind of funny that you weren't allowed to watch certain movies as a kid. Oh, no, no, we can't let you into the theater to watch that. Oh, but you go over to uh, the comic shop or, or the grocery store, which is where most kids, you know, um, got their comics or a lot of them. And uh, OK, well, here's an R-rated comic. This guy's getting shot through the shoulder and these guys got killed and there's blood. Yeah. Who's rating these? Well, Stan, and, and, Stan Lee is like, it's fine. They'll be fine. <laughs> right. Well, and in the Me Too movement, like, Clutch is rotten to Scarlet. Like, oh, all yeah. the time, right? Well, and it helped define him as a character, right? That's right. He was he was a greaser from New Jersey. He was yeah. a, you know, he was a, a garage kind of guy who likely would have treated women kind of coarsely. But he didn't treat her poorly he never acted like she shouldn't be there right or you know he would have laid down his life for her that's just the way he was with women and so, what i liked about that whole storyline was he didn't end up with her because that happens too often where you know someone is disrespectful and then she falls for him right, right. oh i couldn't help it he's just so that sends a really really bad message uh, of Absolutely. encouraging that type of behavior. I'm glad that they didn't end up together, that they just always were contentious and that he well, always and was I, a jerk to her. And I mean, her boyfriend's snake eyes, right? Yeah. Like he's got, he's was, got a set on him. <laughs> right. If it was in bad faith or over the line, clutch wouldn't have got away with it. Right? right. Like you're going to harass snake eyes, his girlfriend. Like, yeah. and, and even more so than that, Scarlett was a badass. Yeah, she could have taken care of Clutch at any moment she wanted to. So that was another part that that is why it didn't bother me because I knew she's not a helpless damsel in distress. She could annihilate this guy, and she's tolerating the petulant little, you know, irritant bug. She's like he's just a an a, a gnat, right? Yeah. And, and, but these days, people allow the gnat to be the boogeyman. You know, it's like. They give these people who who do these irritating things such power, you know, like uh, that they stay up late at night thinking what he said and what, you know, just it's uh, part of the responsibility I think people have is to not empower the people who tick them off and just yeah. just move on and say, hey, you know what, you're not really not worth the time. Yeah, I can see that. But I, I you know, did play devil's advocate on some level. You know, being a being a white male, I, I I can't really walk a mile in other people's shoes and say I I know what that's like. So yeah, I, I'll give I'll give them that. But I also think that Joe Brand deserves a ton of credit for oh, putting yeah. a girl figure in the boys' action figure aisle in 1982. Oh yeah, and and she wasn't the travel clerk, right? She yeah. wasn't the go get them boys. She was the first ninja. She was a badass. She's right? basically the first ninja. We all think yeah. Storm Shadow Snake Eyes now, but when I first saw Scarlet on the pegs, first I thought, "What is she doing here? This, these are boys' toys." But I thought, "Well, she must be pretty tough, you know." And and it started to teach me that your gender doesn't matter; what you do matters. Your job matters. And right. it didn't say on her uh, on the front or in her file card, you know, pretty girl. It didn't say. Anything feminist, if, uh, feminine, you know, like mm -hmm. um, model or whatever. I mean, although cover girl, that's her past. But uh, Scarlet's, uh, uh, what is it, covert intelligence? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, like it, it has nothing to do with her gender. And that's when, that's the really big influence G.I. Joe had on me. It taught me over and over and over again with all the different genders and colors, ethnicities, that it doesn't matter what you look like. And it doesn't matter your gender, your uh, what matters is your job. Your job yeah. is the most important, your duty. And so this guy is a heavy machine gunner. He, you know, it, it doesn't really matter where he's from or where his family is from. The guy knows how to handle Ma Deuce and take care of his brothers when, you know, the the Cobras hit the fan. And the same goes right. for, for Scarlet, too. I was like, yeah, it's not a girl figure. Uh, it's it's the covert intelligence. It's the uh, the crossbow it's the sort of ninja. She's got the stars and she's the, the stealth one instead of, oh, there's the girl. Right. Well, and Joe, because they reused so many of the heads and they were originally planning for more unique heads for the guys. But you really have to dig in a little bit to see the incredible diversity of that first year. Right. Yeah. Zap is from New York, but Zap is Hispanic. Right. Uh, uh, 
I think it's pretty clear that Clutch is Jewish. Steinberg, right, from yeah. Jersey. Uh, Oy vey. Uh, Steeler is Pulaski, right? Yeah. He's probably Polish. Yeah. Uh, he's from Pittsburgh. B- Breaker is probably a redneck. He'd say it. But the guy, he's the guy from Tennessee, right? From Gatlinburg. Yeah. He speaks seven languages, right? Like, not, not your typical uh, stereotypical uh, guy from the South. And so he had the I surfer with yeah, uh, surfer rock and roll. Guy. Got your surfer guy. Uh, you got a guy from Chicago. It's a lot of Joes from Chicago. Uh, Snake Eyes, the Enigma. Yeah. Like, where do you think this... he's really from? I mean, he his cabin was in Colorado, right? So <laughs> you always want to go back home. Yeah. That's I'd I'd put money on Colorado, but okay. That uh, doesn't seem just... as uh, that's a safe bet. But you you would just assume that Snake Eyes is like from you know the left side of Mars or something, just with how right? <laughs> how huge he his think... his legend has become. But yeah, Colorado. <laughs> yeah, I think here's I, and I did this dig when I was coming on the Joy uh, Joe Brand. There's never been a Joe from Delaware. It's the one state that never really? got a Joe. Yeah. Weird. And so if you build them up, there's like there's a ton from Texas, a ton from California, a really inordinate amount from Rhode Island. I wonder which, why. <laughs> which is, yeah, you, you can see that one coming. A bunch from Chicago. but Even uh, one from other, Quebec. Yeah, there's even a, even a backstop. Backstop. There's yeah. one from Cuba, right? <laughs> Snowstorms from Cuba, like. They're from all, and I and I like that 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 they're from all over the place. But yeah, yeah none from Delaware, so maybe that's where uh, the mysterious snake eyes. I hail bet from. you, just to balance things out, he's the one. Maybe that's why they never made a Joe from Delaware, because they know that he is from Delaware, and they, and just, they didn't want didn't want to piss him off. The, yeah, or or just yeah, yeah, keep the secret, and and maybe we've just cracked the code. That was uh, one of my things I'll always be grateful for. They were, uh, there's only one Joe from Oregon. That's Dial Tone, the nerd. But as a kid, that meant a lot to me. That I flipped over the file card and he's from Eugene. Cool. I, was, I grew up in Oregon. And so they were, they were doing Night Fox, who had been put out with a vehicle. And he got one of those terrible thumbnail file cards that were coming out around the first movie that didn't tell you anything, really. Mm-hmm. And so we were putting them out in a, uh, a Comic-Con set. And the writer, uh, a gal named Annie, really great gal, who was writing the file cards, said, where's this guy from? And I said, well, he could be from anywhere. Um, but the, here are four states that have hardly any representation. So um, one of them was Oregon. So I threw it in the mix. And she came back and said he was from Crescent City, Oregon. And I was pumped, but I looked into it because it didn't sound right. And it turns out Crescent City is in super north California, oh. like right on the border. But there is a Crescent, Oregon. I, I jumped track there one time. So uh, so I wrote her back. You got to be really careful when you're stepping on, you know, editing a copywriter. Yeah. Uh, and I was new to the brand. Uh, but I, I said, Annie, uh, Night Fox Crescent City is in Northern California, actually, but there is a Crescent, Oregon. So he can be from Crescent City, California, or Crescent, Oregon. He just can't be from Crescent City, Oregon, because it doesn't exist. Right. I said, and I only know this because I grew up in Bend, Oregon. And she said, no problem, I'll fix it. And then I got the proof back, and she changed him to Bend, Oregon. Oh. <laughs> so he's from, from my hometown. That's awesome. So, so some guys actually got their faces on figures. Some guys got their name mixed in as the official file card name. I got Night Fox from little old Bend, Oregon. So oh. that's my my eternal thumbprint on the Joe Brett. If there was a figure based on you, what would uh, what would the code name be? If you if you had a chance to have some input on it, uh, what would the code name be and what would he look like and come with? I mean, just given how allergic I am to the sun. <laughs> Probably have to be night ops, right? Somehow, <laughs> low lights, buddy. Maybe low lights spotter. Yeah. I could, I could, <laughs> <laughs> Look I could over there. <laughs> yeah, I could. I could spot for the for low light. Isn't he uh, the spotter? He's the spotter, though. Here, hold my sniper. scope. Yeah. You, you would well, be the polisher of the lens. Yeah, that's me. <gasps> Essential work. That's what. That's what I did. The the overlooked guy, critical to any sniper team. Yeah, uh, yeah that's me. You also uh, uh, you have the little book with the you do the lines. You know, one, two, right? three, four, one across. 
<laughs> calculate the wind, yeah. all that. Yep, I could have done that. Uh, and an old uh, high school nickname uh, right on the Letterman's jacket said Shark. Sure. So I could have been Shark the Night Spotter. Oh, well, hopefully someone's listening uh, over in Pawtucket. Yeah, yeah, you know, I got I got friends there still. You never know. Hopefully, uh, you know. Let's close on classified. That's that's the big thing a lot of Joe fans are talking about. Uh, what are your thoughts on classified? I have a feeling it's going to be exactly like mine and and a lot of people's. But uh, yeah, let's let's spend a few minutes on classified. I, like I said about Sigma Six, anytime Joe gets play, I'm happy about it, and I, and I wish it well, and then and I have friends on the brand, uh, so I do. You know, I've always wished Joe well. Um, to me, when they first came out, it looked like they were pulled from the style guide of a movie or television show that didn't happen. Yeah. Like the unifying bits, which I like the, the communicators up here and the gold that kind of runs throughout and like resolute I'm, part two or something. Yeah. Kind of. Right. So I was, and I'm, I don't believe that, that you have to just redo the 82 Joes. If you're going to do Joe over again, I yeah, absolutely. Th this chat is over. Goodbye. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a big fan of the 82 guys, but no, I agree. It can't just be that. You got to upgrade them. And I think, yeah. and that's what I worked really hard at on transformers, especially uh, for generations was how can I make stuff that will appeal to the dedicated collector, but also to their son. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, and I, I think I threaded that. That's a hard needle to thread. But I think I did a really good job on Generations and with more support would have done it on Joe. And so I think that's what they're trying to do here. Um, Is it a thankless but, job? Yeah, sometimes. Um, but I think one of the really good things that Daryl did at a JoeCon a couple of years ago was he just came clean about the process. So when people would kill us, like I, I released a two pack that was the ultimate snake eyes with the ultimate storm shadow together in a two pack. They never did that very much. And I always wondered why they didn't, you know, play. I mean, that's a, that's a, a three Oh fastball. Like why wouldn't you play that? Uh, you know, it's going to sell. And people were like, uh, I already have those. And I'm like, well, we made sure to put out, uh, I think it was the renegade. It was a, a storm shadow that was really hard to find. They didn't make enough of it. So we made them readily available, uh, and we put them with the best snake eyes ever. And, of course, it sold really well. But when people would complain, oh, I have those, you're like, okay, well, let's clarify the argument here. That slot was going to be a reuse slot. So if you want to say, I don't want those, the only credible counter argument you can make is, which reuses would you have put in their place? Because it's easy to say, oh, I would have done Pythona and a brand new rock and roll with bigger muscles. Like, cool, who wouldn't do that? Yeah. But I had neither the tooling dollars nor the item count to do that here. So it, when Daryl was open with people about item count and tooling budget, people understood better. And because we were preaching to the 1%, the people who traveled to JoeCon, yeah. they were then uh, deputized almost to relay that accurate counter argument online because Hasbro employees really can't post online. So when someone would go, Oh great. It's the same old Destro. They would go, well, it could be the same old storm shadow or the same old Baroness, but it was going to be the same old somebody. Yeah. And, but I thought that was so smart because it elevated the discussion online and still does. So I, I see what they're doing with reused parts. Uh, I like that they're reinventing a little bit. I hate the chest cut, and they're covering it up more than half the time. Uh, it puzzles me that they're releasing troop builders as store exclusives. Yeah. So there's there are some things that I think are not that hard, um, but it's also a fine line too. They're very careful not to hire fanboys too much at Hasbro. Right. Because it's the the old saying is you don't put the fat guy in charge of the candy store. Yeah. <laughs> so and there have been brand managers that were too close to it and made two obscure characters that they knew they wanted. So but I'd like to think I always straddled that line very well of understanding the brand, knowing what the collector wants, 
but also knowing what would bring new fans. Mm -hmm. And I think they're trying to walk that fine line with the classified series. It's tough. I mean, especially with the experience that a lot of a lot of us have growing up and having collected the way we did. So many of us collected the 82 line first and then the 83 line. We didn't have a choice, right? And then the 84 line and everything is just in sequential order. And we know that Dusty is newer than Rakondo and he should come after Rakondo. And it's we just love the way it played out. And there aren't too many Joes of the original line where I go, man, I wish he came out in 82. Like, I don't sit and go, I wish Leatherneck had come out in 82. No, I don't. I, I'm glad Gung Ho came out in 83. And that's awesome that a few years later, instead of redoing Gung Ho, we got a new Marine called Leatherneck. Mm -hmm. And then in 87, we got a new Gung Ho in the Dress Blues. So when you see something done so right, you go, well, it's been enough time. Enough people don't really remember it. And there's enough kids out there who don't know anything about this. We want them to be able to experience all the fun that we experienced. So that's why with the classified line, I, and I was and I was hoping I was hoping to guys. It was the RD Green, and then the following mm -hmm. year, give us Duke, give us Gung Ho, just put them out in in the order. I get why they can't do that. No toy company can do that. Right. Mattel is doing the same thing with Origins. They're doing an amazing job with it, but they're putting out Man at Arms, and in the same year, they're putting out uh, Scareglow. One of the last figures ever made back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you do, right? You you throw out the popular characters, but and you have to because you don't know how long it'll last, and if it's not successful enough, you won't you won't get to wave two or three. Right. Yep. But I don't know. I, I guess I'm not much of a gambler, but if I was in the position calling the shots, I would gamble and I'd say, All you're getting is the eighty two OD Green Joes. Right. And if you want more, I, I just feel it in my bones. Sometimes I get these feelings in my bones when it comes to G.I. Joe. Not much, not so much for the other toy lines, but with Joe, it's just kind of in my DNA. And I go, the the fans, they will come out. They If you build them, those those 82 classified Joes, if you build them, the the, the Joes out there will come. And, I, I believe that's true. It may be a harder sell to retailers because they are kind of drab yeah. a little bit. And that was partly why they're cool, but... They have done a really good job with their Hasbro Pulse uh, mm -hmm. initiative, and I think that's a perfect spot for it. Just put out Grunt. Yeah. You're never going to sell green Grunt to Walmart or Target, but put them out. What, you know, you might have to tool a thing or two, but once you've got him, then you can make four or five other green 82 Joes off of him. Yeah, and, or even like a head pack, head and helmet yeah. pack, and, and harness. If you do that buck, that body... I'm not going to nitpick here and say, hey, Zap was a lighter lime green and right. Grunt was a more blue green. And, uh, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not going to. There are nitpickers out there and I don't I don't think they should be quoted and, and given the power, kind of like, you know, the power that the clutches of the world today are being given the power. of. I don't think those nitpickers should be quoted so much and screen capped and and given that power. But I would be happy with some sort of a, an 82 uh team builder pack where you got the buck and then you've got a, a 13 heads well i guess 12 and then Scar right. scarlet wouldn't really count but uh well i guess snake eyes either okay maybe not you know even 10 of them because the camo with stalker but i mean you could make short fuse grunt hawk even steeler you know depending yeah. on you know with the gloves and stuff like that that's a doable thing it, yeah they wouldn't be wouldn't bending be over backwards uh and and it would make a lot of fans happy I'd love to see them do that on Pulse, and I think that's where it fits. I'd love to see them do a, a, you know, a sizable vehicle on their HasLab. Like, and maybe it's just a vamp, right? We're probably never getting at anything tank-sized. But a vamp for 180 bucks on HasLab? Yeah, I'd be down for that. Mobile Command Center. <laughs> oh, boy, right? Like, I mean, shoot for the moon, right? But. Yeah. But I did. I thought that was very encouraging this fall that they did Baroness with a cycle. Yeah. Because there are some small Joe vehicles that really resonate. The Claw and the Trouble Bubble, the Ram, yeah. the Low Crawl vehicle, for God's sake. God. Like, there's uh, there's some stuff you could do. So I like that. I like that vehicles aren't off limits. Yeah. They're just, you know, going going nice and slow. So. Yeah. Man, I've had such a blast talking with you today. And uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with you again. So hopefully again soon 
here on my channel and uh, also on uh, What's on Joe Mind as well. There's so much more to talk about. It's cool to just talk to you about the behind the scenes stuff, but also the fan stuff too. And and you really are like the absolute best type of person to be working there because you're not just like, you know, the, the super fan who doesn't understand the business aspect of it. You, you say, well, you know, it's nice to remain true to the brand, but also we need to move units. So mm -hmm. you're not just motivated by the dollar sign. At least I, I don't believe that's what motivated you. But at the same time, you just understood the reality of the situation. And sorry, guys, we can't do this thing that would seemingly make a lot of fans happy because there have been instances throughout history where they toy companies did something that was supposed to make fans happy and the thing just rotted on the shelves yeah. forever. Yeah. And it's, it's a, you know, I, I hate to, to slam Joe fans because I'm one of them, but they did a really good Sky Striker and they did a really good uh, Tomahawk that was a ton oh, of tooling. Yeah. And and they sold OK, but not that. but not great. And so when fans would argue, how come they don't tool up new vehicles? I'm like, how much better did you want them? And there was a there was a strong online feeling or maybe it only felt strong back then. Of the well, I'll wait till it hits Ross kind of fan, yeah. right? I like it, but I know I can wait and get it at half price. That's fine, but you're really not supporting the brand. And so, if you're not willing to support the brand at full price, then don't be crying when it goes away because yeah. you were part of the problem. So that's true. That, that's but that's I, very it, true. And it, I remember when the Sky Striker. I never saw a. Uh, um, tomahawk or eagle hawk as they renamed it in my area ever like it was never released around this area for some reason uh we did see the sky strikers though but i remember when i picked up the eagle hawk it was on ebay for next to nothing because they were just rotting on yeah. the shelves and people were picking them up and going whatever 20 bucks and yeah. now that they're hard to find impossible to find and cost so much people think well they must have flown off the shelves no there's there's a lot of toys out there that are worth a lot of money that just rotted on yeah. the shelves for a long well, time before they went up in value. And the Eagle Hawk, I had, I had nothing to do with that. That was all before I was on the brand. But it was a beloved vehicle, a great vehicle, and a vehicle that aged poorly because mm -hmm. all the rotors got all funky on everybody's Brutal. vintage one. Yeah. And it was one that was never re-released. Never. So it was the perfect one to actually sink tooling dollars into and make a bet on. Yeah. But but in the end, it was just it wasn't bad, it was just okay, and that's not enough. But I I did like I wanted to make sure I I thank you for it. The idea, and I saw it a billion times. You can absolutely tell when a brand manager cares about their brand, and when they're just checking off a box. Because if you want to be uh, a senior vice president, you better work on games. You better work on a girl's brand. You better work on a boy's brand. Uh, you better spend some time in U.S. marketing. You better do some digital time. So you've been in every foxhole. You're ready to be promoted. And you could always tell the people who were just passing through versus the people who actually cared about and understood their brands. Mm -hmm. There, You just can't fake that. So, Yeah. Well, Mark, thanks so much for your time today. And I hope everyone else... Enjoy this chat as well. Looking forward to more chats uh, in the future. Uh, plug time. You've got What's on Joe Mind. You're on that every week. What's on Joe Mind with uh, Mikey Rosari and Joe Colton. Uh, I'm the new the new kid. I've been there a couple months. <laughs> but uh, great, longest running Joe podcast. Uh, and I was always a fan. And I, w I would fill in when I could. And then when they had an opening for a full-time host, they – Made me the offer, and I was thrilled to hop in. So, yeah, check us out at What's on Joe Mind. Anything else you want to plug, too? No, that's about it. I mean, uh, that's both enough. Like, both <laughs> that's enough. Right? That's you know one. what? That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, well, yeah, let's give a, a – and it's funny because this actually resonated with me more than I, than I thought it would. Uh, just to note the passing of Eddie Van Halen oh. yesterday, right, who – Van Halen's 1984 is what made me a rock music fan. So, yeah. uh, I, you know, when celebrities pass, I don't, I don't know them. It's, it doesn't usually rattle around, but that one really did. Well, so, and I think it did with a lot of people. So you don't know them personally, but something that they did spoke to you. So yeah. some 
people can speak to you without speaking to you. They can speak to something in you without directly speaking to you. So, um, yeah, I, the, the whole thing of, well, you never knew that celebrity. Why do you care? I mean, Heath Ledger's death hit me hard. Um, yeah. You know, never talked to him, but it just seemed like a, a really wonderful human being. You hear the stories about him. Eddie Van Halen, absolute genius. Rest in power, Eddie. Um, it's hard to see the heroes, you know, pass away. But the way I try to look at it is they pass on into legend. So, yeah. He's uh he's rocking out somewhere else and uh yeah. keeping well, the music I, going. I do like it the the upswell when a, especially a musician passes is all of a sudden you hear their music everywhere, right? Yeah. And I think that's the coolest guy to salute for a musician. So Absolutely. All right, everyone check out Mark on What's on Joe Mind. Hit him up on uh I'll, I'll share your uh whatever social media you want shared to in the description, if any. I don't know how, how uh, private uh, you want to be. I mean, I'm not private, but I'm not interesting either, really. So <laughs> what's on Joe Mind's probably good enough. Uh, yeah. Once again, thank you. Uh, thank you for the Gary Goggles uh, figure for your for your part in that. And you you know you said you, you didn't feel like you had a lot to do with, but um, that that was a, a big uh, thing for the Joe community. You know, it was yeah. uh, it's important for us to pay tribute uh, and and remember our you know our friends and and. You know the the people who brought the best out of us in the community, and uh, I didn't know Gary either, but I got that set, and you know I've opened a lot of toys and uh, futzed with them. That's the word I use. They futz with them. They're cool. Yeah. That, that was a very special figure. That that was something that meant more than just um, the the characterization on a file card. Um, that was Gary being immortalized into plastic, and. Uh, I can see how you were saying earlier that that's a tough knock on the door to say, hey, sorry about your loss. Can we make a toy uh, out of him? Right. Um, but the, really the way I think it comes across as this was a man who many, many people loved, cared for, and will always remember. And we want to immortalize him in plastic. And maybe, you know, plastic isn't a word that really makes you go, oh, in plastic. But, right. but he is... Uh, he is in toy artistry history, you know, he is, yeah. uh, he's in my collection. He's in a lot of Joe fans collection. And, uh, it's, it's super cool that, uh, Gary goggles is, uh, driving vamps and flying sky strikers and keeping watch on, uh, on the decks of the USS flag. So thanks for your part in having, uh, that actually happen. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, I, I'm just very careful how I talk about it because I knew it would mean a lot to a lot of people. I just never I want to make sure it's never overplayed that, oh, I did this for my buddy because yeah. I never I never had that opportunity. So I'm always very clear about that. But I love that his family was there when we announced it. Right. It was really it was very cool. We made, you know, some some memorable out of a tragedy. And yeah. so I was I'm very proud of that. And I never knew him either. Never. Same same as you. I never had any interactions with him. But um, his. uh you know, his memory resonates, uh, you know, the waves continue to resonate, uh, even with the people who, uh, never knew him. It's just cool to know that there was someone like that out there. So I'm, uh, I'm glad that there's a, a figure of him out there. And, uh, I hope, I hope someday that we get the, uh, you know, the honcho figure right? or, uh, you know, <laughs> shark, shark, the night spotter, shark from Oricon with yep. a little rag to wipe down yep. <laughs> low lights, hey, low light it's scope. A, it's essential work. Somebody's got to do it. A little spray, a little spray bottle for the lens. Yep. yep. You know, <laughs> yeah, that'd be fantastic. So thanks again, Mark. Really appreciate it. Hope everyone out there uh, enjoyed this chat. Thanks for uh, watching Toy Guys Talking. We're listening uh, on whatever podcast catcher you might be listening to. Take care, everyone. Uh, and until next time, yo, Joe! And Nerd Mustache. Nerd Mustache.